He is noted for having 700 wives and 300 concubines. Solomon's marriages to foreign princesses were politically motivated to secure alliances. However, these wives brought their own religious practices, leading Solomon to build temples for their gods. The peak of hormonal impact on human life is somewhere between 15 to 30. Forever, people have been doing their own things beyond the legal relationships. Things have been happening in the societies. That involves a certain risk. Somebody who is willing to take that risk, that's for them. Really binding yourself in such a way that truly you can depend on yourself or it's like visiting restaurants every day, you want to taste something new and see. If you try to obliterate it, you will become even more perverted in your mind. So there are many reasons why one indulges in sex. Sadhguru, my next question for you is, uh, why can't one husband be with multiple women and one woman or a wife can be with multiple husbands in today's society among consenting adults? And uh, what impact do these uh, people have when they're involved in such relationships? Well, there are many aspects. So historically, you know there has been a Draupadi who had five husbands, all right? There is, this has been a matriarchal society where in many parts of the country, even today in some parts of the country, it's still practiced that uh, five brothers are married to one woman. These things were done at a certain time when the social situations were such. Or men were married to many more… I mean more than one woman. This was mainly because men died more often than women. Today both men and women are outside, both may get killed, that's different. But at that time, largely women stayed home because she was continuously pregnant. From the age of fourteen to forty-five, fifty, she's almost all the time either ha she's pregnant or she has a young child. This is how life used to be. So because of that, she stayed home and she took care of the property and the agriculture and stuff. Man went out to do business or for war or something else, he went out. So men always died more often. So generally, in most societies in the past, the number of men was much less than the number of women, always. This has been the state all across the world. So naturally, when so many women were there, they needed care and they needed support in the society. And those days, a woman could not exist by herself. She, unless she is protected by a male uh, a partner, it would be very difficult for her to exist by herself because she would be exploited in so many different ways. So always they attach themselves. So naturally a man ended up having two, three women because the num… the population ratio was like that. But now largely it's leveled out. If some individual does it, it's not an issue, but if that becomes a social norm, then how do you decide somebody has whatever, multiple wives, and how do you decide somebody has no wife? This will become a social, you know, collision it'll become. It'll become lot of problems in the society because we may act civilized. I'm… I'm very particular, I'm very clear about saying we act civilized. But we, when we are denied basic things that we need, all our civilization evaporates and we will behave… behave like animals. Yes or no? So, when fundamentals are denied, people will go flashing. So, that's not going to work in today's world. And above all, the women's condition will become very bad. Those days there was no dirt, if you had land, it was okay. You had five wives, it doesn't matter. You had twenty-five acres, it was good enough, everybody ate well and that's about it. But today our requirements are not just about eating, it's about many things. So that kind of thing will lead to lot of complicated situations in the society. It's better to stick one-on-one -on -one and uh, anyway, forever people have been doing their own things beyond the legal relationships. Things have been happening in the societies. That involves a certain risk. Somebody who is willing to take that risk, that's for them, but others will live within the legal format, it's a balanced society.
If you're asking this question in a more existential way, well, <clears throat> see, this… this is a certain framework of not just of bone and muscle and flesh, there is a certain energy framework. Only because of that, it takes in a certain form. See, if you eat mangoes every day, and let's say a cow eats mangoes every day, at some point, will you or the cow get confused whether you are a cow or a human being? Or will the cow get confused? Such a thing never happens because there is a clear-cut inner framework to which flesh and blood is added. But there is a framework, an evolutionary memory framework is there, it never gets broken, isn't it? So in this framework, how strong you keep this framework, how, integ how much integrity is there to this energy framework will determine many things about your life, many aspects of your life. Especially if you want to ra raise this life to another level of function, it's very important you maintain this integrity. This is why irrespective of which religion, which spiritual process, if people want to raise them till to a certain point, first thing they will talk about is becoming monks or brahmacharis or sannyasis because the idea is to create such a level of integrity that this is a whole life by itself, that it doesn't lean on anything else for support, either for physical well-being or emotional well-being or psychological companionship, it doesn't lean on anything, it stands by itself because you want to take it somewhere else. If you want normal function, these things are not necessary. Now you want to become a rocket which breaks through a certain dimension of space, now you need to be in a different level of force and integrity, otherwise it'll crack up. So you don't want to open your body to anything and especially opening to multiple partners has its own negativity in that context. How much pain and… you look at uh, Draupadi's life, how much volatility, how much pain, how much suffering she went through in her life and how much pain and suffering she caused because of her anger and jealousy and whatever else. So these things happen for a variety of reasons, you can't blame everything on that one aspect, but that aspect also has a, a say in these aspects because you're opening up your uh, memory body, your energy… energetic body which is essentially ruled by memory to variety of memories. This will cause a whole lot of turmoil within the system which could affect that life and many other lives. So Draupadi's life is in a way a sample for that. It's not an absolute. This is not an absolute but this has an influence. How does one decide whether one should or should not have premarital sex and does it prepare us for a better marital life? See, different people are made differently. This happened. There was a little turtle, baby turtle. With great difficulty, it climbed up a tree, went and sat on the edge of a branch and jumped, fell flat on the ground. Again, it took another twenty-four hours for it to slowly climb, get to that branch, again jump, again fell flat. Like this, it, day after day it was doing. Then there were two birds in the opposite tree, they were sitting there and among themselves they shook their head and said, I think it's time we tell him he's adopted. <laughs> For everybody, we're trying to draw the same prescription. This is not going to work because I've seen, you know, every day I'm meeting thousands of people, they're poor, they are problems on me, all kinds of stuff. What I see is all these people who talked about great amount of freedom, when it comes to their personal lives, after thirty, forty years of marriage, not two, three years, after thirty years of marriage, still what the wife did or the husband did thirty-five years ago, still point of conflict. <laughs> have you seen or no? You have also seen. So when you know this is the state of human mind, you must know what to do and what not to do. It is not… it is not a question of morality, 
It's a question of what kind of life do you want to craft for yourself. It's about that. Is it a morality? Is it that nobody should get into anything or everybody should get into something? There's no such thing. What kind of life are you wanting to craft for yourself? A kind of life where your relationships mean really binding yourself in such a way that truly you can depend on yourself or it's like visiting restaurants every day you want to taste something new and see, but you could get very unhealthy with that. There are some people who stick to their home food, though it tastes about the same every day, but those people are generally healthy, isn't it <laughs> This is not… I'm not trying to teach you a moral class. I'm not a moral class person, but these kind of things are happening in the society. People are trying to draw prescriptions. Everybody must do this, otherwise you're no good, or everybody should not do it, otherwise you're no good. No, that's not the way. There was a time in this culture and even every culture, by the time a girl is fifteen or sixteen, she was married. By the time a boy is seventeen or eighteen, he was married. Now because of our education systems and professional requirements and society has changed, everything has changed. Because of that, average marriage age for girls is around twenty-four in this country right now and for boys it's crossing twenty-eight, thirty. The peak of hormonal impact on human life is somewhere between fifteen to thirty. After that it's not the same thing. So. This is at least something we must debate, but we should not be hasty to draw a conclusion, this is the way, that is the way. We must give enough awareness to people that they don't get into something compulsively which they regret later. If consciously, if people see that this is the way I want to craft my life, that's up to the individual, but there is no common prescription, it should… there should never be a common prescription because individual requirements are very different. A six-year-old girl came home one day from school and asked, Mama, how was I born? The mother was embarrassed. She said, a stoke dropped you. Said, okay. She noted down, Mama, how are you born? A stoke dropped me too. Mama, how is grandmama born? A stoke dropped her too. Then the girl became serious and she went down and th sat down and started writing something in her homework. Then the mother was feeling uncomfortable, she finished her cooking and then the girl had finished her homework and left the book there, she went and read. So the essay was about the family tree. So the girl had written, for three generations in my family, nobody had a natural birth. <laughs> so because of absurd ideas, either we exaggerate something or we try to unnecessarily play it down. It has a certain role in your life. If you make it too big, you will become perverted in your head. If you try to obliterate it, you will become even more perverted in your mind. So there are many reasons why one indulges in sex. For some, it is just pleasure. For some, it is a way of building this bond and companionship. Otherwise, people feel they are going away from each other. They may be just fine, but a lot of people, it is psyched in their mind that if they are not sexually involved, they are actually moving away. Not true. You can be very close to somebody and need not be involved in any physical manner, isn't it? But societies are psyching, especially in this part of the world, people are hugely psyched. If there is no sexuality, you don't really have a relationship. In fact, the word relationship, it's only… it took me some time to understand that here, if you say a relationship, you are supposed to understand it's sex-based relationship. Nothing else is a relationship. If… if I… I can have a very strong relationship with you and not be concerned about your body, isn't it? Yes? I may not be drawn to your body in any way, 
but I can have a very powerful relationship with you. But all those possibilities are completely discounted. A relationship means you must be in some way physically involved, man, woman or man, man, woman, woman, whatever you like. Essentially it's body based. What kind of body is individual choices, but essentially it is body based. This has happened because somewhere our identification in the body has gone beyond normal levels of identity. It is excessive identification with the body. That is why body-based relationships have become the crux of the society. Essentially, most of the sexuality that's happening on the planet is happening because of a certain compulsiveness, isn't it? It's a compulsive drive. After all, now I'm speaking, this is a kind of energy. You are looking at me, this is a kind of energy. You are listening to me, this is a kind of energy. These are different expressions of the same life energy, isn't it? Now sexuality is also another expression of the same energy. Now one has to decide how much of his energy, in which direction he wants to send it. Because after all, you are a limited amount of energy, isn't it? See, it's just like you have an income, let's say you have five thousand dollars a month, how much for the house rent, how much for eating, how much for schooling, how much just for fun, how much for vacation, you a portion, isn't it? Tomorrow morning, you got your salary, in the evening you went out and blew it up, now the next month is going to be trouble, isn't it? Of course you have a credit card but <laughs> everything in your life, if you are handling your life sensibly, everything in your life is apportioned according to your understanding, your need and your capability, isn't it so? Yes? Your money, time, energy, isn't everything allotted the way you like to arrange it? This is also the same thing. How much of it? First of all, do you need it? Or are you doing it because of socially you are psyched? If there is a need, if I ask you to stop it, you will become perverted because it will all happen in your head. If somebody is telling you, you have to do it, if you don't do it, you are not normal, another kind of perversion will come, both are not needed. It is just that if there is such a drive, it is there, but you understand the limitation of it. After all, you are not going after a man or woman, we already looked at this, you are going after a certain level of pleasantness. So once you experience a certain level of pleasantness, wouldn't you like to dig deeper into this because whatever pleasantness happened, maybe you use the other person, but the pleasantness happened within you, right? So suppose, anyway the pleasantness is happening within you, the other person is just a key to open this, wouldn't you like to have the key in your own hands? Yes? That if you sit like this, you are on full scale. <laughs> you don't need anybody because to extract pleasure out of somebody, you have to play any number of tricks. It's, it's the, it doesn't happen simply. This is called as courting. <laughs> Once you go to the court, the judgment day will come. It takes enormous amount of time, effort, energy and all kinds of other things, frustrations, jealousies, problems, everything attached to it. You are here constantly looking, what can I get out of this person, what can I get out of that person? This is a con job. It's called a love affair <laughs> but it's a con job. But if you are extremely ecstatic by yourself when you are being with people, it's about sharing your ecstasy, it is about if they are not touched by it, somehow to touch them with it. 
rather than seeing what you can squeeze out of them. The whole fundamentals of your life will change. Here are five famous individuals who were known for having many wives. King Solomon. Solomon, son of King David and Bathsheba, was the king of Israel known for his wisdom, wealth and construction projects, including the first temple in Jerusalem. He is noted for having 700 wives and 300 concubines. Solomon's marriages to foreign princesses were politically motivated to secure alliances. However, these wives brought their own religious practices, leading Solomon to build temples for their gods. This caused him to stray from the worship of Yahweh, leading to his spiritual decline and internal strife within his kingdom. The introduction of idolatry angered many of his subjects and led to God's disfavor, which eventually contributed to the kingdom's division after his death. Genghis Khan Genghis Khan, born Timujin, founded the Mongol Empire, the largest contagious empire in history. He had many wives and concubines primarily for political alliances. Managing relationships with multiple wives from different tribes and regions created internal conflicts and rivalries. These tensions sometimes extend to his offspring, causing power struggles and disputes over succession. Such infighting weakened the unity of his empire after his death, leading to its eventual fragmentation as his descendants beat for control. King Henry VIII Henry VIII, King of England, is famous for his six marriages. His quest for a male hire led to significant religious and political changes, including the creation of the Church of England. Henry's marriages were fraught with personal and political turmoil. His desire to annul his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon led to England's break with the Catholic Church. His marriage to Annie Boleyn ended in her execution and his subsequent marriages were marked by further personal tragedies and scandals. His final years were characterized by increasing paranoia, health issues and a tumultuous court life all exacerbated by his marital strife and the lack of stable succession plan. The Prophet Muhammad Muhammad, the founder of Islam, had 11 wives. His marriages were often for social, political or compassionate reasons. Muhammad faced challenges managing the dynamics within his household. Instances of jealousy and conflict among his wives required him to exercise considerable wisdom and fairness. The incident of if where false accusations of infidelity were made against his wife Aisha caused significant personal distress and impacted the community. Despite these challenges, Muhammad worked diligently to ensure justice and harmony among his wives, although these issues added stress to his already demanding role as a religious leader. Brigham Young As a prominent leader of the LDS Church, Brigham Young played a crucial role in the westward expansion of Mormon pioneers, eventually establishing Salt Lake City as a major settlement. Young's 55 wives and large number of children, estimated to be around 56, were part of the early Mormon practice of polygamy, which Young strongly advocated. His large family and multiple marriages were intended to fulfill religious commandments and to help build a strong, interconnected community. This practice, however, drew considerable controversy and legal challenges, eventually leading to the LDS church's official abandonment of polygamy in the late 19th century. These individuals experienced significant personal and political challenges due to their polygamous relationships which often led to internal conflicts, power struggles and a lasting impact on their legacies and the societies they govern.